Good morning, everyone. It's now tomorrow here on NBC. Many years ago, more years than I care to remember, I can recall my father taking me to see one of the first motion pictures that I remember going to see with my parents. Uh, the star of the motion picture was Farley Granger. He was one of the stars of it. And it was called Strangers on a Train. It's a long time ago, over 20 years. And I couldn't believe at the time, and I can't believe now, that uh, sitting across from me on the program this morning is the man who appeared on a train platform in that picture carrying what I recall to be a bass fiddle case. His name is Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, he is a legend in his own time. I suppose he would despise that title, but he has been called that. He is uh, a motion picture director, a television personality. And uh, he is going to be with us for the entire program this morning, and all of us uh, are pleased and honored that you would take time to come down here and do this with us. And I would like to begin by uh, asking you a question that pertains to your films. I'd like not to talk with you this morning about movies, but rather about ideas. I may not be successful at that, but uh, I'm going to attempt. All the pictures that you do scare people. Mm -hmm. What frightens you? What are you afraid of? Most things. I'm scared of policemen. I never drive a car on the theory that if you don't drive a car, you can't get a ticket. So therefore, that's absolutely true. I'm scared stiff of anything that is to do with the law. Although I'm fascinated by it, but I would hate to be involved myself. And I think I'm more scared of that kind of thing why? I'm a coward, I suppose. But what is there about a policeman that frightens Alfred Hitchcock, who has made so many films about what policemen do? Well, that's the thing, you see. Most people think that I am, because of the material in which I indulge, shall we say, mm -hmm. uh, uh, professionally, that I must be a monster. Well, I'm just the opposite to that. I'm a very placid, calm individual. And I am scared of uh, getting into any difficulties. Somebody once said to me, what is your idea of happiness? I said, a clear horizon. Not even that horizon with a tiny cloud, no bigger than a man's fist. It has to be absolutely clear. Ingrid Bergman once said of me, she said, the trouble with Hitch is that he won't have a fight. Because I walked out on her when she was bickering about something on the set. And uh, I just walked away. And when her head was turned, she looked back and I wasn't there. May I bring you back to the policeman for just a moment? Yeah. What could a policeman do to you that would frighten you? Well, he could um, charge me with some offense, like parking, and then I would get a ticket, and that would scare me. I, I'm, I'm like the man in that old legend. I think it's called, uh, it was a man who was supposed to pay two dollars. It was a, an old music hall sketch. Well, apparently he quarreled with the policeman. It was a, a, the fine would have been two dollars. And then in doing so, he hit the policeman. And now he was a, now it was assault. And then from that, he was uh, moved to the jail. And there, he got into trouble with another prisoner and he uh, attacked him, and there was a fight, and eventually this prisoner was killed. Now he was arrested for murder, tried, and was on his way to the electric chair. And somebody said, why didn't you pay the two dollars? <laughs> and the policeman is probably the only man who can come to you in the street and for no reason at all say, won't you come with me? 
and you really don't have much choice, do you? Well, my uh, stomach would turn over. I, a joke was played upon me, and I'm not kidding, it did scare me. What was the couple, Jinx Falkenberg, and what was the name of her husband? Tex. Tex McCrary. That's right. I did an interview with them, oh, many years ago in New York, and I sat in the little studio, and there was an empty chair opposite me, and suddenly a policeman came in and sat in the chair and scared the hell out of me. <laughs> he said, may I see your license? I said, I don't have one. And he did it as a gag, but it worked. Well, you'd best behave tonight or we're going to call the cops. We will continue with Alfred Hitchcock after this announcement. We continue now with Alfred Hitchcock, the motion picture director. Uh, <coughs> You and I have very little in common, but we have one thing. We uh, have some Jesuit training in our background. Oh, I didn't know. Yes. That uh, you had that stigma. Do you consider that to be a stigma? <laughs> no, let's call it a stigmata. <laughs> Why do you say that? You know, I saw a terrible thing once. I'm not kidding. In a French magazine. And it was uh, one of those satirical French magazines. And there was a picture of God sitting on a cloud, a bearded old gentleman. And just slowly coming up through the cl clouds was the figure of Christ with hands held out and a woe-begone expression with holes in each hand. He's looking up to his father and God is poking his tongue out at him. He said, there, you see, I told you not to go down there. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said. Yeah. I, I, the only reason I brought up the thing about the Jesuits is I've never heard you, I've watched you on some of the other programs, I've never heard you talk about uh, religion, what part it's played in your life, what part it's played in your producing or directing of motion pictures. Has it played any? I wouldn't say so, no. Uh, but I would say that the Jesuit training, I believe, gives you a sort of clarity of mind, a reasoning power, which you don't, you don't realize it while you're being uh, taught as a young boy, but that's what they're doing to you. Did you have to take Latin? Oh, yes. Sure. Me too. Eight yeah. years of it, and I could never understand uh, why. Oh, you had to learn all Latin, the ablative absolute. I remember that. I don't go quite that far into Latin. Oh, I can really? do Arma Verumque Cano, Troye, Qui Primus Arboreus Oris, which are the first two lines from Virgil's Aeneid, and that's as much as I can remember. But Latin taught me English, and probably you too. Mm-hmm. Could be. Well, enough of the Jesuits, as John J. Schmitz, a candidate for the presidency, said in 1972, there is nothing wrong with the Jesuits that a good inquisition would not cure. That's what he said. Come rack, come rope. That's what they used to say in the days of the inquisition. In the uh, making of motion pictures, a director is often portrayed as a violent man who screams and yells at actors and says, ready on stage, and waves his arms around the lot. Mm -hmm. By your own admission, you are a placid man. Are mm -hmm. you this placid when you're at work? Well, first of all, I'll tell you an interesting thing. I've only been on another set once in my whole career. And that was when I first came to Hollywood to sign up with Selznick. And I was given a lunch at Paramount Studios and shown around the studios. But I've never been on another set. I've never seen another director at work. Just saw this one director. And I was astonished to find he was addressing everyone through a public address system. Now, I've heard about directors and how they behave in the manner in which you describe, you see. 
And the only thing I could say about it was, it seems to me, all the drama is on the set and none on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> they leave it right there. <laughs> yes. Now, it's been said, I mean, that they don't know when I'm directing. Well, I don't direct, you see, because I discuss it with the actor or actress in their dressing room. What makes you angry? Not so much about your work, but about life, things that people do to you. Stupidity really? makes me angry. And, uh, you know, certain things in one's work, which are, you get, I hate to see a scene where they're pouring wine out of the wrong bottle. All those details, it's the details that bother me. How about life? Uh, you live in the world, you read the papers, I'm certain, and you listen to the television news programs. Uh, you're in your 70s now. What do you think about the world around you? What's going on well, in this world? Well, it's in a, a great difficulty because of communication. See, communication is the reason why people get disturbed. Years and years ago, there wasn't any television, there wasn't any radio, and there were just newspapers, and they were very dull-looking newspapers. They weren't... Um, I had a friend, an editor of the London Daily Express, who invented the new front-page layouts with headlines all over it, you know? And pictures and things. Pictures and... Uh, but the main thing was to give a big headline to every piece, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but in those days, years ago, if you look at a paper, say, like the Kansas City Star, it has a little headline at the top and a long column of print. There wasn't the communication, you see, but today, people have it thrown at them from all sides. Do you not like that? Do you think the world would be better if there were not this instant catharsis? That well, because you've got the, uh, the situation of people copying what they see. You know, we hear of uh, the influence of, uh, of crime being copied, you know. Now, I, although I deal in the same thing myself, I don't, I only regret one thing that I ever did in a film that was copied, and that was um, Foreign Correspondent, a picture I made at the Goldwyn Studios here. I don't know if you ever saw it, did no, you? No, I did Joel not. Joel McRae, it was called, very elaborate film, very big film. And uh, in it I had a big scene laid in Amsterdam uh, with a politician, an important politician on the top step. And the whole thing was massive umbrellas, trolley cars, the center of the city. And uh, a cameraman came along and said to the politician, your picture, please, you know, they had a bit of cameras in those days. And he had a gun in the right hand. And he took the picture and shot the gun and assassinated this politician. And I heard it was done in Terrahan two years later. And that you regretted? Yes, I think that was, uh, okay. you know. One of those things. One of those things. I wonder why it is, and I've said this before, <laughs> people always copy the bad things that they see in media, whether it's on this tube well, or on the, the same as news, after all. Bad news is news. Good news is not, not interesting. You'll find that in all newspapers. Only bad news. You know, all about bad men. Is interesting, but it also becomes more appealing. I, I have to do this. Yes, but I know. Well, appealing because it's like audiences, uh, uh, say, watching one of my pictures and they get scared and so forth but they feel comfortable because it's there for the grace of God, go I. But what I meant to say <clears> was, <throat> when people see something in media that is violent or that is criminal, 
it has been said that there are certain minds that will go out and copy that. What I have difficulty comprehending is if media shows something good, why don't as many people go out and emulate that? Because uh, that doesn't give them any satisfaction. Uh -huh. as, as I've just said a moment ago, they look at the man in the bad situation and they say, my God, let, thank God that's not me, you know. The image that you have uh, contrived, and I'm certain you've done this carefully over the years, is one of dourness, of seriousness, uh, of conveying an impression of mystery. Does Albert Hitchcock ever tell jokes, or do you have a little sense of humor where you would? I would say more that way than the, that's the whole thing I was saying to you earlier, that people think that one is a monster and they relate me to my material that I put on the screen. Well, and you're a rather imposing gentleman. I mean, you are. Oh, I, don't, I wouldn't look at it that way. I mean, because. Well, you look uh, pretty imposing to me. So. Uh, <laughs> no, I used to. And strangely enough, uh, I don't know whether it's people have become more unsophisticated, but I used to indulge very much in practical jokes of a very high order. I used to have great pleasure from them. I remember once at Chasen's, when Dave Chasen at the restaurant, his restaurant had a garden at the back. Uh, I gave a birthday party for my wife. And just to liven it up, I engaged from central casting an aristocratic old lady. I had her dressed by the studio, hair beautifully done, and sat at the end of the table. And then disowned her. <laughs> Guest arrived after. I said, who's the old lady? I said, I don't know. I'm trying to find out. The only person in the secret was my wife and Dave Jason. And every person arrived and said, and they looked around and said, out here. I said, yes. I said, who's the old lady? I said, I don't know. I went to find out from Dave Jason. When he comes, I'll send him over. So Jason came back and uh, came out eventually. And I said, Dave. Is this old lady sitting at the back, at the end of the table there, back of the garden? I'll go and see. So he went and he bent over her, said a, apparently a few words, and came back. He said, she says she's with Mr. Hitchcock's party. I said, it's nonsense. I've never seen a woman before in my life. And I hadn't. So she sat there the whole evening and got stiff in the bargain <laughs> <laughs> and bewildered everyone. She didn't. Well, it's that, that sort of uh, joke that amuses me. I once gave a dinner in London and I had um, two or three important guests. I had Gertie Lawrence, Gertrude Lawrence, uh, Sir Gerald du Maurier, that's the father of Daphne du Maurier, who was the leading actor on the London stage at the time, two or three other people. And uh, all the dinner was blue. Everything you ate was blue. You mean the food? The food. But celery, carrots, all that stuff? E everything. The soup was blue. The <laughs> trout was blue. Chicken the moon was blue. Was blue. <laughs> really? And we told Gerald de Maurier that it was going to be fancy dress. So he came as a Scotsman, and nobody else was, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we got him in some different clothes later. Well, those sort of jokes I used to enjoy. You know, talking about bringing someone in and telling them it's got to be fancy dress, and then it's just the opposite. It reminds me of the man invited to a nudist party. He arrived, and the woman he showed him into a room, all piled up with the people's clothes, and said, well, she undressed and was completely nude, and entered the living room, and everybody was dressed. <laughs> that a horrible joke. <laughs> I wouldn't perpetrate that one on anyone. You don't do that sort of thing. No, no, not that way. I want you to introduce America, for those people who haven't heard it yet, to uh, something that we talked about on one occasion uh, some time ago, uh, rhyming slang. Rhyming slang. Remember when well, you asked me if mm, I knew how the raspberry got its name? Well, yes, yes. 
Well, that's a vulgar one, so we won't go into that. Well, rhyming slang really goes back to almost to nearly to Elizabethan days. It goes back very, very early. It's a, it's a jargon used by traders so they can communicate with each other without the customer understanding. Now, for example, to give you some example, rhyming slang, stairs, one of the most famous is stairs. You don't say stairs, you say apples and pears. You do? Yes, apples and pears. And then with the usage, the rhyme gets lost. Uh, going up to bed, Uncle Ned, the wife is called the trouble and strife. Sister is skin and blister. So that going up the apples and pears... Going up the apples, you say. Oh, you don't you do the whole thing? You, no, usage is such that the rhyme gets left but off. But if I said going up the apples and pears to see my skin and blister would be going up the stairs to see, see my... my sister. And what merchants would you use this so that customers would not know what they were talking about. Yeah, that was the, uh, that was the uh, origin of it way back. And, uh, oh, there are many examples, you know. I suppose, that's the nose. Mince pies are the eyes. North and south, the mouth. And uh, German bands. I had an actress one say to me in London, she said, um, Half a cock while I lemon my Germans, would you? I beg your pardon? <laughs> she said, half a cock while I lemon my Germans. She wanted to go to the toilet, which in polite English is, I'm going to wash my hands. Half a cock linnet, that's minute, while I lemon squash, which is wash, my hands, which are German bands. In those days, in Victorian times, I had these little German bands on street corners, you know with a man with a hat. Is this used anymore in, uh, in England? Oh, all the time, yes. You're kidding me. Yes. Uh, I remember walking on the set one day and the chief electrician said to me, hi, Governor, nice pair of almonds you've got on. Nice pair of which? Almonds. Well, there's a sweet meat in England called Almond Rock. It's just a lot of almonds in, in candy, you know, all stuck together. But Almond Rock is for socks. <laughs> you say to me, nice pair of socks you've got on. Nice pair of almond boots, rocks. daisy roots, you know. And uh, one day another actor said to me, after our first child was born, he said, how's the Godfa? How's the which? Godfa. So I didn't know what he said. So I said, oh, uh, yes, all right. So later on I said to someone, what does he mean, how's the God? Well, he's saying, how is your child? How is the God forbid? Which is rhyming slang for kid. <laughs> How's your kid? But he only said God for. He didn't even say God forbid. Oh, they lose the rhyme. Everybody lose, understands it use so it, well. You know, they, sure, know they know it so well, they don't have to. Oh, it would be kind of a, uh, amateurish. It's corny just to use the whole rhyme. Well, then we can let the whole country spend all night wondering uh, how the raspberries really got its name. Now, we, we will not tell, because it would be corny to give the rhyme, wouldn't it? No, no raspberry is, uh, uh, is raspberry tart, that's all. Yes, sir. But that said seriously, no humor about it at all. We're still on rhyming slang. And they... No, this is not rhyming. This is, uh, the use is the way things with, with the meaning get into the language. All right. What would you not do in a movie that you were making. Today, they put everything on the screen. Uh, these X-rated pictures, there's nothing left to the imagination insofar as morality is concerned. There are very violent pictures made where horrible things are done to the human body. What wouldn't you do? What turns you off in making Well, pictures? what turns me off are what I call uh, all-in wrestling matches in bed. You see that all the time, you know, it's a cliché uh, you know, they shoot past the man's shoulder, leaning over the girl in bed, and, you know, but it's just unnecessary. I think it's um, cheap and vulgar. But you're not against the use of nudity in motion pictures. Not, you use no, some frenzy. No, no, I used it in the last picture, but in very sparingly. The, 
Olympics, I made frenzy. I had to show nudity a couple of times, but it was very important to the scene to show these couple of cuts anyway. But normally, just showing it, just for the sake of showing it, I think is bad taste and unnecessary. And that you would not do no, in no, a picture. No, no, no. Anything else? Is there anything uh, uh, violent that you wouldn't put in the picture? Well, you see, I've never made movies about professional criminals or cops. If you'll notice, if you look back over the films that I've made, generally speaking, they're about ordinary people mm -hmm. in bizarre situations. That's the whole essence. The movie I made, like, uh, North by Northwest, Cary Grant. It's an ordinary businessman. Gets mistaken for a spy. And of course he goes through the most bizarre experiences. Well, it enables the audience to identify themselves much more closely with the individual. They can't identify them with, themselves with a cop. They look at it objectively. They can't identify themselves necessary with a criminal, unless there's an intense interest, such as there was in the Mafia, in the, you know, the uh, Godfather. That's a different thing. That's, you know, uh, uh, a thing they look at objectively. But I've always gone for average man, the ordinary individual, going through extraordinary experience. Is that the, the basic theme that you look for if you're looking yeah. for a story to film? I, whether I want to or not, I seem to gravitate toward that. As a matter of fact, I'm doing a, 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 a preparing a script now with uh, Mr. Ernie Lehman, and we're working on a story which shows an innocent couple getting involved in, in very important uh, 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 abductions of people, kidnapping. They know nothing about it. What is the name of that? I don't have a title. But these are ordinary people who get caught up in something. Yeah, get caught up in a very serious... When, 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 when you're doing this, I don't mean to interrupt you, but when you're doing this, like putting together a scene, uh, the one that everybody likes to talk about is uh, <clears throat> the shower scene in Psycho, or. Mm -hmm that one especially. Can you feel what you think the audience is going to feel when they're watching that, when you're putting it together? Um, I hope so. Except that a scene like that took me seven days to shoot. Because although it was only on the screen for 45 seconds, there were 78 separate pieces of film joined together to get that stabbing and that effect, uh, one hopes they will. You know, you can't predict. But I've been, you know, around long enough to know what audiences, uh, how should we, may I say something vulgar, to make the audience feel, uh, you know, there's not a dry seat in the house. I mean, that's the aim. If uh, you don't know how to do that, nobody knows how to do that. Huh? Well, it takes a lot of design. It's uh, knowing audiences, knowing what they feel, and it's like suspense. Suspense comes out of giving an audience information. You see, so many films, they call them mystery films. I never make mystery films because... No, we know. Because if the audience don't know, how can they emote? It's like a whodunit. I never make whodunits, because you've got to turn the last page before you find out anything. So a whodunit, in, from an audience point of view, is an intellectual exercise, like a crossword puzzle or an anagram. You're wondering which of the five people... So there's no emotion. It's just calculation. But suspense is very different. You tell the audience that there's a bomb under that chair and will go off in five minutes and make them wait. That's right. We uh, have a little bomb that's going to go off here from uh, 
the sponsors or the commercial? Yeah. And then uh, we'll... Make it a profitable bomb. No, not at this time of the morning, sir. We'll continue after these public service messages. <laughs> In the uh, last segment, you said you were in preparation of a picture now, and uh, again, how long will you keep making movies? Uh, there are fellows who retire from your craft at 45 and 50 years old, figuring that they've made all the pictures they want to make or they've said all they want to say, but you're still going. I still will go. I have no reason to stop. I've got many more pictures to make, but... Um, Talking of, of stories one would like to make, we were talking about that earlier, while the uh, commercial was amusing our audience. Uh, the story well, I Well, you left want, them without dry seats, so they had to yeah, do something to take care the, of that. Uh, one of the stories I wanted to do for our television show was a famous story by Lord Dunsany, an English poet. It's a classic story. A man and his wife moved into a village, I think it was a lady in England, moved into the village and uh, they rented a house and a garden. And uh, the man asked the landlord if he could cut down 12 larch trees which were surrounding the house. And uh, he got permission to do that. Well, they lived there for, oh, I think about a year or two, or maybe not quite as long as that. And the wife was missing. And uh, people asked him where was his wife, and he said, well, she's gone away or something, pretense. But gossip, as it does in all villages, increased to a point where he wasn't uh, really believed. He wasn't given satisfactory answers as to whereabouts of his wife. So the police moved in, and they began to uh, asking questions. Well, eventually, it got the search for the wife got so intense that the police practically accused him of murdering her. But they had no evidence, no body. They were digging up his garden in search of this woman and finally gave it all up. And the case was closed. But it so happened a university professor took an interest in the case and he visited this village and made some inquiries around. And finally, in the local inn, he found a, a traveling salesman who traveled selling like ketchup, relish, that you, that you have with meat, you know, like A1, mm -hmm. whatever the names of these things are. And the, the traveling salesman said, you know, a peculiar thing happened the other day. I was visiting the general store, and the lady who runs it told me that she, something struck her as being rather peculiar. So the professor said, what was that? Well, she said that this man, who was accused of disposing of his wife, came and bought two bottles of this within the space of a week. And she said, that's totally unusual because one bottle usually lasts a person two or three weeks. So the professor said, ah, now I know the end of the story. That's all the story is. <laughs> You're going to leave. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Listen. Somebody said, why did he want to cut down the 12 large trees? He said, ah. That was to give himself an appetite. <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> what a horrible story. <laughs> I told you it was a horrible oh, boy, story. Boy, you did one on television. I remember watching where they came to the club to have dinner, and it was lamb, armistrand. Yes, that's was, right, yes, yes. And, and Robert Morley. Exactly, yes. and the yes. lady... You tell that story in case somebody has not seen that. That's a Well, it was a famous club, and uh, the whole idea of the story was that it was a, sort of a suicide club. When are we going to have lamb? Aristan. And it turned out to be human flesh, you know. So, let me tell you one more interesting story. I think we have time. I'll tell it quickly. A man was riding across the Australian desert. 
in his car, South Australia, loaded up, and the back axle goes. He sees in the distance an oasis, and there he trudges and finds it beautifully kept, rings the bell, man answers the door, explains his predicament, say, will you come in, sir? And the man, the, the owner of the house comes in, and uh, he explains his problem. He said, well, uh, the owner of the house, a very dapper, well-dressed man, sort of like Clifton Webb used to be years ago. And uh, he said, well, the only thing is, the nearest place is 100 miles back from where you've come. He said, if you care to stay here for a night or two, I'll have my man take your car back there and get it repaired. He said, well, that's a wonderful idea. Thank you very much. So the, everything is arranged. He goes up to the room, changes, comes down for a cocktail, and is introduced to the man's wife and daughter. He's struck by these two attractive women. In fact, the wife attracts him very much because she could almost be, they could almost be sisters, mother and daughter. And after dinner, and everything very polite, goes to bed, and at midnight, there's a tap on the door. He switches the bedside lamp, and the door op half opens, and the voice of a woman says, please, no lights, no lights. He says, all right, turns the light off, door clicks, and she comes over to the bed. He said, you know, we live a very lonely life here, as you can see. And gradually, a conversation, as she begins to caress him, his hand first, and finally, of course, the, the inevitable. About 4 a.m., she says, I've got to go, it's getting light. He said, but tell me, which are you, mother or daughter? I've got to know. She said, I don't want you to know. It's, let it be that way. Goodbye. She goes off. Well, that morning, coffee and breakfast by the pool. He looks from mother to daughter, gets no sign at all. And he's absolutely baffled. He leads it. I didn't sleep well last night. It all oh, probably had a strange bed and so forth. Second night, same thing happens again. He said, I tried all day to get some sign from you. Nothing. She said, I'm not going to give you any sign. No. Same thing in bed. 4 a.m. She goes. Have a wonderful night together. Following day, same thing again. Third night. He said, you know, my car's repaired. I'm leaving tomorrow. Why don't you come to Melbourne? Meet me there. So she said, no, no, no. Let this be our last night. She's now, he feels the tears, and embrace, and so forth. And she goes. Well, in the morning, car's ready, and so forth. He looks at mother and looks at daughter, shakes each one by the hand, and presses it hard. No response. And the owner of the house escorts him to his car. He said, you know, I dare say you've wondered why we live in such a remote space, remote uh, place just as this. He said, uh, well, the man said, if you wouldn't think me impertinent, I did wonder. He said, well, you see, we have another daughter that you've never met. And she's the reason why we live here, because, you see, she's a leper. We uh, will continue after this announcement. Wow. <laughs> I know from reading about Alfred Hitchcock that he is a man who loves grand food and good wines, and uh, he's now on a diet. He's lost 14 pounds in the last two weeks. I would say, yes, oh, yes, 14 in the last 10 days. I would say that in my lifetime, I must have lost altogether... 500 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. You ever wonder where it goes? <laughs> I lost 100 pounds when I was making a movie with Tallulah Bankhead, Lifeboat, 1943. I lost 100 pounds. What is the reason for this newest diet? I'd reached a plateau. And it was a decision one has to make, and not too heavy. I was having great difficulty in getting up and down the apples. 
<laughs> yes. And pears. How do you uh, lose 14 pounds in 10 days? There have been all kinds of diets. You have no, um, you keep to 750 calories a day. No bread, no butter. Nothing in the way of desserts. Just some meat, string beans. That's it. Yeah. Do you drink a lot of water like some people do? No, no, I don't believe in water because that's the very thing they're trying to get rid of. <laughs> exactly, but they oh, say no, if you drink get, eight or ten glasses of it a day, it no, will. No, no, get rid of it. I don't believe in that. I think in the dieting you should keep yourself dry. It's a terrible time to go on a diet with the holiday season coming on, all those Christmas goodies. Uh, no, it's, 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 you have to turn your, not your back on it, you have to turn your front on it. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> Did you ever think many, many years ago, uh, when you were first starting to do this, uh, that it would come to this where they would be writing books about you and uh, doing retrospectives on television of your films, that you would be worshipped by young filmmakers as a master of your craft. Could you foresee all this back in 1915 or 1920? No, not at all. I think the most gratifying thing that I enjoy about one's job is being able to appeal to world audiences, the Japanese. See, I can walk down the Ginza in Tokyo and be recognized. They know you, yes. In Japan, they know me. And uh, that's, that's the most gratifying thing. And it comes through one's work. Not through one's publicity agent or what have you. Same in Germany. i never forget we crossed the frontier once at uh, Metz, entering France. And the gendarme put his head in the window and said, Ah, each cook. <laughs> and then we had to wait, and he brought, went inside and brought out all the other officers and gave them all autographs. Now listen, I'm not an actor or anything of like that. This is very All flattering. directors are actors. What? All directors are performers. I'm not. Actors. Oh, you appear I, I in your movies. I would never sink so low as to be an actor. <laughs> Do you mean that when you were uh, on the television series that's uh, still running, that when you came on and said good that, evening, uh, that that was not no, carefully that, put I, together? No, that's uh, just... Uh, Dignified introductions, you know, uh, to be an oh, to be an actor. It's, you know, I've called them cattle for years, and they for still thirty keep years. I call <laughs> all actors cattle, and they still keep coming back to the barn, don't they? I remember Tyrone Powell's wife, when he was alive, she said, to him, "Why do you call my husband cattle?" I said, "Well, he's nice cattle." <laughs> We'll do a nice little interruption here, and then we'll continue and say goodnight to our special guest this time, Alfred Hitchcock. This whole hour has gone by faster than any of us had hoped, and uh, all of us on the program are indebted to Alfred Hitchcock for coming here uh, this time and sharing with us some stories not only about films but about how he feels and what he is afraid of. I, I trust you have some word of reassurance. For... Uh, just that the, the, um, the leprosy, I want to assure you, is not contagious, although I think leprosy would be a nice name for a girl. <laughs> Have a great day from all of us on The Late Shift in California.